Hello, and welcome to the disability myth. My name is Dominic, and I live with a fatal disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Together, my amazing caretaker, co-host, and best friend, Uriel and I, plan to debunk misconceptions, share our personal experiences, and shatter your expectations. But we're not stopping there. We're bringing in experts, thought leaders, and everyday people who are smashing through societal barriers, paving the way for a more inclusive world. Whether you're tuning in to learn, empathize, or simply to be entertained, the show promises to be an eye-opening experience that transcends boundaries. Because when it comes down to it, what makes us different is what makes us extraordinary. You know, there's there's a lot of, still a lot of attitudinal barriers. And the ADA, although it was a great achievement for its time, it's also it, it's pretty clear, right, that people... um at least the non-disabled majority of people, right, and even us, um, have a long way to go in terms of educating ourselves and, as I said, just learning from disabled people. Um, yeah, no, I, I think those are all very valid points, um, and I totally agree with you. And I'll, I'll respond by saying, you know, we started this podcast to for a couple of reasons, but one of them is to share our stories, right? Not only my stories, but everybody who's on this podcast and their stories. Um, and, I'll, and I'll share a story real quick because it seems relevant. Mm -hmm. When I was at UCLA, you know, I, of course, like I've mentioned probably before on the podcast, had my accommodations in order with the Office for Students with Disabilities. They're aware of my SMA. They were aware of my, um, you know, my condition, mm -hmm. my limitations mm -hmm. physically. Mm -hmm. And um, as I've mentioned on the podcast before, you know, in order for me to use the restroom, I have to have somewhere to lie down. And, you know, when I would go to take my final exams and midterms and whatnot, I would have to leave my dorm and go all the way to the opposite entire side of campus to take my exams because that's where they proctored you um mm -hmm. to give you your accommodations which for me mm -hmm. like i've said before we're just extra time um a scribe to fill out my answers for me and like uh breaks for suctioning to clear my congestion and um one of the major issues that was never addressed when i was there though uh, that I really wished I would have pushed harder for mm -hmm. was my bathroom needs because, like I said, I had to cross the entire side, other side of campus to take my exams. And that was about a 25, 30 minute walk from my dorm room. And I had nowhere on campus I could lie down to use my urinal. Mm -hmm. And so I had one time you know, as embarrassing as this is to say, I'll say it because it needs to be said, right? Um, I literally peed myself because I had stayed up all night and, you know, crammed a bunch of Red Bulls, mm. studying for my, my like, uh, astronomy exam. Mm. And uh, I regret not peeing before I left. I never leave anywhere now. I never leave the house now without making sure my bladder is empty <laughs> um, because that taught me a very important lesson that day. Mm -hmm. um, but it's unfortunate that it came to that, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel it's important. Like you said, you, you turn that rage that you may have regarding the issues that we face, you, you, you funnel that into mentorship. And so I guess what I'm trying to do here is funnel my stories in my rage of pissing myself yeah. <laughs> into um you know making people aware of just our everyday kind of struggles so yeah and I think yeah. thank you for you no know, for sharing that very personal story I think that um this is like a very like it's it's um it's a very important and critical story which is this is the like this is the basic needs right that we're talking about and yep. 
one thing I would like to say is and one of your questions was how does being an advocate get to you sometimes? <laughs> right? Um like you. Uh you know, and this is especially true at the university setting, unfortunately, um, for many physically disabled students, right? Um, and for many of us, we've only been like we've only known the reality of we're, we're the only disabled person, right, in the room, let alone in spaces, right, from any learning environment, right? And so um we have to acknowledge there's some uncomfortable feelings and also awkwardness that comes from being right um in that position being like well but maybe if i'm an advocate then i have to as you said be very open about you know, these very personal things. There's a lot of vulnerability involved in being an advocate. And I think, I think we have to, you know, acknowledge and be thankful, right, to all these people who, right, like, came before us who were in that same position of, you know, giving these stories. Hmm. But that takes work. I mean, that takes a lot of, you know, not just um, mental energy, but you as an individual have your own, like, unique embodied experience. And so thinking about how um, this is your, like, your basic needs, right? We're talking at, in, you know, at um, USC um, and even at UCB, one of the biggest issues is, like, housing and you know, just getting around in the classroom, um, having your own desk, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, you can imagine, right, that like you, um, I've, and not being able to take breaks or whatever it may be, you know, given the structure of the program and the way that, you know, and I would like to say that sometimes the university the way that these disability offices are operating is from their perspective, typically. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that leads us to think about, okay, what are the limitations right, to that? And what accommodations, let alone just things, right, access needs that we could request? And I think you bring up a really good point, which is, I don't speak for everybody, and we both can agree on that, but we can agree that all of us deserve to have our basic needs met. Yeah, and well, we, and like, I don't know if you're aware of, mm -hmm. uh, familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Physiological needs, they're not very high up on the totem pole. It's a very basic, very basic need. Right. So the fact that like someone such as myself had it, you know, urinate in my own pants. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. it speaks a lot to, I think, the problems Oh yeah, that are well, being overlooked. Um, right? I definitely feel like, um, and this is what I'm saying, like, even the fact that you're, you're telling me this story, right, or that you have this story to tell, let alone, you know, this knowledge that you can, you know, either give to people that you're close to, um, that is powerful in itself. <laughs> yep. Um, I think that for me, you know, there's been many times, um, because I'm also, as you said, like autistic, and I also um there are many times where I I find that I can be a mentor to others that are younger than me or perhaps, you know, going through something very similar but there's not a lot of mentors out there for me to look up to that's how i always felt growing up too so and like yeah, that's what there's that as well which is like 
well, if this is the bare minimum, meaning the legal, from the legal standpoint, right, the um, school is required to, um, state school, right, in this case, then what does that actually, that doesn't actually translate, perhaps, um, right, to something that we actually need, right, to, right. I, I think you bring up a good point, which is like, if we don't have our basic needs met, whether that's housing, physical therapy, psychological support, which I've had trouble getting, um, you know, and USC has health insurance, um, so I pay for that fee. We're paying for things. We pay the same tuition. That's another thing, too. Yeah. Um, so what does that actually mean for us and at, not only now, but like in the workforce and, you know, does that mean that basic needs won't be provided for us, <laughs> you know, right. at that basic level? Um, and so I think your story, like it eliminates like many important um, points, which is that, you know, we're at the university level, this is, you know, and um. There's a lot more like neurodivergent students, but there's not many physically disabled students, mm -hmm. at least um, in my experience. So that's why, you know, we're often an afterthought, right? When they don't think about that. And it's often, um, I think that we have to acknowledge again, that disabled people throughout history have been right, like exploited, abused, right, tokenized and, and subjects neglected <laughs> by and for disabled, um, non-disabled people because yeah. that's who's doing the research. And we really have to acknowledge, okay, so if that's the way that society has gotten knowledge about disability for so long, which typically is the case, then how do we be an advocate with our own in our own right and our own um stories to tell because to for you to be think about for you and me to be friends one and then to also be this like open it takes a lot and it takes a lot of not just people but it takes um, a lot of growing in, in you know, all of us, right? So, um, and my hope is that instead of always tokenizing us or making us feel like we're the only one, right, that can kind of give this advice that, I mean, it is a basic need, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we all, um, I think, understand that in order to, right, like, survive in this, not thrive, but just survive in this um, capitalist society, that we have to advocate for ourselves as no one will. I think that, right, right? so your story, um, it brings up, you know, and I have very similar stories and this one it i'll just briefly there's been a lot of instances where um i've like been you know in an emergency um with like a fire or the fire alarm goes off yeah. right what do they do to me or not to me but for me in that situation <laughs> they often they don't know what to do Yep. Right. So yeah. um, I remember the fire drills going off at UCLA when I used to live there. Everybody mm -hmm. would evacuate. Every person that was able to would evacuate by going down the stairs. And then when everybody was done, mm -hmm. they would have me take the elevator down. As if like an afterthought. Not that, you know, there's like an inherent problem with me going last. I mean, we could argue there is, but it's just, it's not good 
it's not a good look. It's not good no. for the optics, you know? No. Like, no. why are they completely neglecting this one group of students, right? right. right. It's just a drill, but still, the principle is there. Right. Right. And you're speaking to a really good point, which is these are, think about it, the, there are institutions in our society that we know, right, have the prestige and the expertise, right, to, to um, serve, right, these students. But I think part of it is we have to make sure that students, as you were speaking to earlier, are even comfortable, right, to ignite their passion to talk about like yeah you know what they're going through right like um even the fact that you know like we're able to speak about this says there were people in our lives that like um that really wanted us to be an advocate for ourselves but for others because um, one thing that my dad always says is, you know, be the change that you want to see. And for a while, I was like, you don't understand. Like, you know, <laughs> this is really hard. And I just want to give up. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think, you know, it wasn't until um, you're, you're um, in the adult world and you're learning along the way that you realize that not every person um is as comfortable as you are um even the fact that you say well that was that was not a good look who's gonna who's gonna bring that to their attention <laughs> right yep. um, okay. and that's very hard to do for some people right or um it's very hard to do when you don't have a community behind you that is also yeah. saying yeah that that you know, he, he can't just leave Sophia or Dominic in, like, the classroom while you evacuate. In a burning building. You know? Yeah. 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 So, um, anyway, thinking about how, um, and the, each one of those experiences, um, even though they, they hurt us sometimes, um, and they degrade us, which... Um, not a lot of people actually talk about enough, which is um, the emotional toll that comes with just, right, like ableism and every day, like having to see it and also just experience it. But imagine if you don't create spaces where people feel comfortable or can do that, then... How are you supposed to move forward as an inclusive society that, you know, accounts for, um, and I don't know. It just, sometimes it's surprising that, you know, even the top institutions or not even schools, it's just everything, right? The system doesn't serve people that need the most help or are the most impacted, right? Right. That, um, which, um, I think, I've, I don't know about you, but I feel invigorated after, after every time I um, mentor students or help them with project or, like, putting golf carts on our campus, right, yeah. at UCSP or doing something like that. But... You also have to remember that with that emotional toll, there is, as I just said, an opportunity for, you know, collective um, visibility, you know, uh, again, being conscious of the diversity of your community and being like, well, who's not? I think one of the things I've learned from the, like, the autism, um, because I was a um like a leadership um delegate for one year and it was um the autism self-advocacy network and one of the things that'll always like stick with me is um you don't have to put all this pressure on yourself um to advocate all the time but 
you can advocate for the people that you care about like around you in your life yeah and all of that and um because it's hard like systemic problems um yeah they <laughs> they'll take a long time to address but i think just being able to say you know i did that and that was rewarding right Yeah, um definitely. i think that's what what's kept me going um and others going like this far Yeah, no, I 100% agree. We've obviously covered a lot here regarding advocacy, the intricacies of it, the effects it has on us as individuals. But I think the last thing I want to ask you is, do you believe there's a quote-unquote right way to advocate? In a, or a wrong way to advocate because I've always felt when I saw other people advocating issues for themselves that like I feel like the loudest people can be the most easy to ignore but the quietest advocates are the easiest to pay attention to at least in my experience like I'm personally more drawn to people that you know, aren't so quote unquote loud and quote unquote, you know, on the front lines. It's the little things like I feel like this podcast that will resonate at least hopefully resonate with people, you know? Mm -hmm. No, and and uh, you bring up one of the like core questions I think that a lot of people have about right, like advocating. And what I would like to say is right. There's a difference between serving your students and managing them. <laughs> which is something I learned recently in my leadership class, um, managing and, and, and um, you know, serving them rather than actually advocating with them, right? Or advocating, you know, for their, what their needs are and all that. And um, I think that we really have to be careful. So a good advocate acknowledges um their positionality in their community so yeah. what privileges they have why they're able to stay like i was able to um speak to the mayor of santa barbara for example that is not something you typically you can just do yeah. right so being aware of where you are right in your community even if it's as small as right in Santa Barbara for example um good advocacy or good advocate looks at the collective rather than just the individual individual yeah so you're looking at the diversity and the nuances of your community and looking at those most impacted because sometimes even though I can speak to, for example, like disability justice advocacy, um, for example, like I'm not, you know, a mom or a parent, so I couldn't speak on some of those, right, um, inequities or those problems, right, maybe one day, but right now, I, right, like that's not my, um, expertise, right, right. Like, um, and um, lastly, I'll say is I think language and knowledge, um, like the way that people learn about things and not just learn about it, but then speak about the discourse surrounding, right, mm -hmm. is more important than people realize. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a good advocate is always aware, right, of how that language, one, is important to the community. And for example, like um, person first and um, identity first, right? There, There's all these nuances, right, about how, but knowing, right, that um, 
language and the way that you talk about it also the way that as I said before like no person in that community can actually represent everybody so yeah. um I think being conscious of just the way that people talk about disability for example sometimes uh, let's take um the university setting for an example it's very different in my opinion from how i would serve right disabled students in a more holistic right intersectional mm -hmm. way um but that's because we typically we we look at it as services right and we typically we look at it from a very medical um model view right, right? so the um, framework in which you want to advocate from and use the language and learn about the um, community from is as important as, you know, what you're doing and um, all that. Because, yeah, I've had multiple um, encounters with even adults that are like, why? Um, why is this language, for example, um, why is, you know, like identity first language, why is it so important? And yeah. it's not until I explain that they're like, oh, that makes sense. So right. being able to um, listen and learn actively, always doing that, I think is something that, um, and creating space, um, like you are right now to talk about that, um, I think is like really, really important. A bad advocate, on the other hand, <laughs> um, does pretty much the opposite of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I would say um, that I've had to learn is um, that... Um, one language for some people language um may be different but it's it has a significance so it's important to like sit you know see people with different perspectives and why um and the other half is sometimes it can be hard to um as i said like take your anger and your frustration and put it to action but for me i I think a bad advocate, um, it's funny because um, this was my freshman year of college, so I didn't know what was ahead. And I think a bad advocate is basically one that doesn't validate like others' experiences beyond their own. And I think yeah. for me, I had to learn that this is bigger than myself now, right? Which is um, why, you know, I did all all of the uh, advocating that I did, but I think that it's important to understand that um, advocacy is not just about policy, right? Um, back to your definition. And it's also, um, and, you know, um, change is also about, compassion combined with as i said the intentionality and also yes. um yeah just all of these things and having having compassion beyond yourself at that point yeah um, because yeah there's so many students outside in and outside of higher ed that i've you know worked with or mentored or worked with their families and um, they're so grateful. Their families are so grateful, right? Or so um, happy to talk to me or have their child speak to me about their future, right? Yeah. But that's what true advocacy should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... That's what keeps me going. I, I, it gets me kind of emotional, but 
I think that's that to be, as I said, forward facing and intentional. Um, and then validate feelings, but don't like um wallow in them. Or, very important you know like reminisce <laughs> because yeah. um i've done that before <laughs> that's a slippery slope so yeah. yeah yeah no i love that and i think you bring up a really good point too that um it's important to look beyond the individualistic perspective and take in all the perspectives that as best you can everybody comes from you know one of the first things I learned in my communication courses is that people come from different cultures on a micro and a macro level. And that has a strong impact on their values, their beliefs, their lifestyles, mm -hmm. everything, right? So you may encounter some people that, such as myself, you know, personally, I like the term person with a disability. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people might not. A lot of people might just refer to themselves as a disabled person. And that's like a good, that's, I think, a culturalistic perspective that yes. doesn't have to be set in stone. Mm -hmm. People are able to change. Their values can change. It's difficult, but it can happen. And ultimately, I think that uh, one of the experiences I took away from being in a part of the um, South Advocacy Network is that exact fact, which is we all want the best for, you know, ourselves and our loved ones. And there's a reason why, you know, this language is used, right? Yeah. Or why people want to be, and to not speak for people. I think that they're... Um, is unfortunately a lot still out there where um, disabled people aren't the ones talking yeah. about themselves, let alone communicating about themselves, right? And of course, you know, this seems to change, but I think that a good start is actually, um, as you said, creating space and making people feel like there are nuances yeah. in that community. And, you know, actually setting the time. I know people are like, what do you mean? The time, the people, and the... Um, you could even get rid of money for a sec. But the time and the people to listen, it, it really does make a difference, right? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I agree. I agree. With for sure. Any final thoughts, bro? No, that's all. Was all well said, man. <laughs> really excellent. All right then. Well, can I ask uh, Ariel something? Yeah, go yeah. for it. So, as Dobbs like caregiver, like you're you interact with him like every day. <laughs> yeah, um, just a little pretty much. Yeah. And my question to you is. How do you see yourself, even though you're not the one, like, you're not in his body and you're not experiencing, right, like, some of the things, how do you see yourself as an advocate as well? Because I, I think a big point also is the people that are in our, as I said, network of care um, are also our advocates. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I've always viewed Dom as a friend first, but then I remember when I started working for Dom, the first interaction I would get when I tell people that, oh, that I'm a caretaker, oh, you're so nice. Oh, you're the best. They really need it. Like stuff like that would always get to me because it would like, it, it would piss me off a little bit because it almost came mm. off as a little dehumanizing. It's like, oh, you're so brave for doing it. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> like it has to be done, right? Yeah. And like the systems in place aren't helping. So I have to step in, you know, it's, it's always like, so how do I feel where I fit in? I don't, I'm not quite sure. It's like, it's complicated because um, a lot of the time it's me doing my best explaining the people 
that I enjoy doing it, but also a little infuriating at times because I've, you know, like as Dom said, like disabled people are just kind of treated as a second thought or whatever, and they're praising me for doing the work. Doing but like, doing God's work. <laughs> right, but it's, um, I don't know, it's what I'm doing is good and it's I like helping. But at the same time, you know, over time, it kind of like wears on you, you know, right? But yeah, I just do my best, and I just do my best to tell people to um, what's well, it's it's odd because like even though I'm able bodied, I have to constantly fight ableism in little ways, and that's then people, a really good point. And it's like it's a little, you know, and it's. They can get a, exhausting at times. It's exhausting for me, so I can't even imagine how it be for, for Dom at times, you know, just trying to like, advocate for yourself, even like at a public bar or like a social gathering and whatnot, right? Yeah. You know. Definitely. It's, um, no, I think but, you, it's it's um, really um, great hearing like you and your relationship because like I think that a big part of um, like how we move forward as a society is we are humans and we have human needs but at the end of the day it, it often is seen like or framed as you know extra or something that we have to request and you bring up a good point which is disabled people aren't the only ones affected by ableism let alone you know ableist supremacy and thought so thinking about how we as are the primary educator right the ones but um there's also people that see it that right and are able to um i think that ultimately we all want be, to be treated with the utmost dignity and respect but it is often um it is hard to um as i said like sometimes the people that you care about like to watch them they like, kind of go through that i think it it's definitely um like a very powerful powerful experience and um also we don't <laughs> we don't say this enough but um i thank you to the both of you for like all the work that you're doing um because you know i think that we don't see like we don't say that we see each other a lot like in what we're doing but i do i mean i see yeah. it's funny santa barbara is so small but i you know, oh, yeah. stay in touch with people yeah. <laughs> and um yeah it's great to see like there is humanity in the way that we should treat each other, let alone we care for. It just happens that our society, I think there is something about not only advocating for yourself as a, you know, marginalized person or multiply marginalized, but it's also like one of the people around us are also, you know, aware and aware that this is the proper way to advocate for us, right? Or alongside us rather than just, as you said, you know, like being um, treated like, you know, you're doing um, something <laughs> that no one else wants to do, right? Um, so, yeah, but. I have a lot of those, um, I think Dom can relate. Uh, I have a lot of those pop the bubble conversations. Yeah. Where. I see, especially with like other people, when I talk about disabled people, it's like popping that like, oh, and they have like a moment of like empathy. It's like, oh, you know, I've never really thought about it like that. Well, and like the thing about know? Gabriel is she literally has no filter. Um, He'll just say what's on his mind. Yeah. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. And I love him the more for it. So it, it, I think it goes back to like what you said, overlooking um, or being able to move beyond the individualistic perspective coming together right 
that's what it's all about. Like what we do, You what you do also, on a daily basis. um, I think one thing I mentioned or Ariel like reminded me of is you don't always and you, you don't always have to be polite all the time. And I think that one of the things that I've learned <laughs> is the squeaky wheel Yep. like gets things done. And honestly, Yeah. I feel like uh, people who are like. Disabled people, we, I don't know, we, like, they're like, you swear? Like, why would, like, Yeah, like what's just like wrong a normal with you? dude. <laughs> Like, Oh, man. of course we do. But just always, right, say, like, we don't, ha we have this image, like, charity image, right? And it's, it's time that we're, like, we can speak up for ourselves in whatever form that may look like. And I can... You know, I can um, sw swear and, <laughs> you know, I, you know, but I feel like um, it's funny, we, we typically are the ones to always just be like, um, we take what we're given, Yeah. right? And Mm. it would be, it would be great if we, um, I tell my students that, You know, it doesn't always have to be that way, but right now it is, but you know, it may change. And so, um, yeah, I think we both can agree that um, even though our society has a lot of work to do, like we know um, how to move forward. And um, even though Like, as I said, like, the whole, this podcast, like, the whole myth about being at the front lines, I think people, if you, they look around them, like, I always say, look around you, and there's probably a lot of disabled individuals that are, you know, but that within itself, right, is just the fact that you're here doing your work and doing Everyday life, I think, is a form of advocacy. Yeah. 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 Each And it's one like of you said, yeah. it's like, it's like you said, everyone's an advocate in their own right. And that's important. So, oh, I get with that, but um, yeah, definitely keep going, keep doing the work that you're you all doing, cause it's, it's yeah, it's great. <laughs> you too, Sophia. Oh yeah, thank you. Any final thoughts? Oh no, like she said, it takes time. Um, because uh, every time we go out and do our do our little social outings, or we go to the barber shop, every time we do it, uh, the community just normalizes it over time. Locals start saying hi. It's like, oh, I heard your episode on what? Well, I'm like, oh, you did? I'm like, oh, you yeah. know, I'm always surprised. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. and it's um. It's like the beauty in that is that not only are people in our local area watching it, right, which is in the Santa Barbara County, but like we're normalizing. It, it sounds weird to say it, right, but it's like we're normalizing your existence, yeah, which is so important to do. yeah. And then what happened? And like it, it feels Well, that's weird to the say other it. thing. Like disabled people can get a haircut, go to the Yeah, grocery right. store. I think that. There are so many instances, like you said, where people are like, do you need my help? It's like, well, I wouldn't need your help if <laughs> things were, right, back to the social model, basically. But, you know, thinking about how if this was fixed or if this Trader Joe's, like, it had everything at my level and I didn't have to ask for help, that'd be great. Yep. <laughs> but, Right. you know, just know that... um Yeah, that you're advocating for just by living, I guess, because you bring visibility to Right. those, right? Um, those Like the disabled gaps. experience. Right. Right. And then my only hope is that, like, uh, the more we do it and the more I continue to do it, and then, and because that starts conversations, oh, I heard that you do this thing thing, and then we tell them about it. And then it leads to hopefully this uh, avalanche of education. Yeah. Yeah, where it's like, when we're, now we're like informing the greater community about the challenges and the issues that, Yeah. like, you know, that you have to overcome. 
then all of a sudden, oh, well, I know Dom. You know, he's like, he comes to get my hair. You know, it's like that communal thing. Then it also uh, inspires well, other people to, you know. Final little story here before we, we wrap up. You know, yeah. Like we go to this barber shop here in town. And uh -huh. The guy that usually cuts my hair, he, uh, when I first walked in, or I mean, rolled in to get my hair cut, um, <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah, I remember you from the high school. Yeah. You're the guy with the Jordans. <laughs> the Jordans. The Jordans on the shoes. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me. That's me, man. Jordan guy. Jordan guy. Yeah. And it's nice to be recognized for things other than like your disability. You know? Oh, yeah. So, no, and, yeah, and exactly. Like, I think that we have to realize that um, disability is a big part of how we shape our perspective and everything. But it's also how that perspective if shaped is informed by our disability, but it doesn't mean right that um like it's the first thing people see, let's be honest. So yeah, yeah. I agree with you that with like over Zoom and even now you can't see, but I think it's it's really telling, right? That if you don't have those weighing attitudinal barriers right as much as the physical ones and the policy ones then you can actually do, like create a community and where people can actually be leaders and advocate for themselves and for others and it's it's great when you have people in your community that um genuinely care about you know like um your success and where you are and your everyday i always say the the locals are like i don't know they were the best that when <laughs> i was growing up so yeah um because even though they weren't like in my um immediate like the environment like they did care about like how i was doing you know how she doing and obviously like you i was um i stood out you know quite a lot from everybody else so you know um but in part that is a good thing yeah if the communities around you are supportive yep so, definitely that's cool though <laughs> it's, oh, cool. Yeah, it's fun <laughs> all right i think that's a good note to end on um we hope that you learned a little bit about advocacy today and we hope that if you are an advocate you continue to do so Right. And like Sophia said, doesn't matter how you do it necessarily, because you are an advocate in your own right. So keep doing your thing. And if you liked what we had to say today, please feel free to leave us a rating. A follow. A nice little follow, perhaps a nice little review on Apple Podcasts. We are also, of course, on Spotify, YouTube, the whole shebang. <laughs> so um, be sure to share with your friends and family. If you're not already, be sure to leave us a follow on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Um, we've got a bunch of new followers on Instagram the past week, and uh, we're excited to have you all on board, and we hope you enjoy the episode and the content. So, with that being said, you know the deal. Peace and love, and may the Force be with you. Bye! <laughs>